Following our first episode, we are now set to uncover the finale of the Battle of Berlin, marking the most brutal and bloodiest stage of this series. At this juncture, the German High Command is mobilising every available man for a final defence of the capital, utilising any means necessary. Simultaneously, the Soviets have encircled the city entirely, with Zhukov more determined than ever to deliver a decisive blow that would secure a Soviet victory in Europe. On the German side, they find themselves outnumbered, outgunned and engaged in frantic battles in the West against the Western Allies. This conflict transcends a mere pursuit of a German victory. It has become a desperate struggle to delay the inevitable Soviet triumph over Berlin for as long as human endurance permits. By April 25th, Generals Zhukov demonstrated their strategic prowess by reorganizing their frontline units in Berlin, drawing on their extensive experience gained from the brutal siege of Stalingrad. Armed with the hard-earned lessons from that historical ordeal, the Russian forces were well prepared to undertake the formidable task of besieging the city. To tighten the noose around Berlin, they meticulously formed assault groups, each consisting of a company of infantry supported by six or more anti-tank guns, a troop of tanks or assault guns, engineer platoons and a flamethrower platoon. The assault groups embarked on relentless and continuous operations, advancing through the city with unwavering determination. Their methodical approach involved demolishing buildings and clearing rooms, leaving no room for respite for the defenders. This unyielding action set the stage for the final phase of the Battle for Berlin. The combined Soviet forces encircled the inner city with an imposing array of almost half a million troops, 12,700 guns, 21,000 rocket launchers and 1,500 tanks. Up to this juncture, the Soviet front line had breached the capital's outer defensive ring in only two primary areas, to the east and north. The defenders on the perimeter largely consisted of remnants from units that had been withdrawn after the fervent displays on the 18th, 20th and 25th by Panzergrenadier Divisions, the Muncherberg Division, 9th Paratroop Division and SS Divisions Nordland and Charlemagne. Alongside them were Volksturm and various other formations, collectively forming a garrison of nearly 300,000 armed personnel. Notably, a significant portion of this force, nearly 50,000, comprised inexperienced combat soldiers rather than seasoned veterans. The challenge of facing such overwhelming odds added another layer of complexity to the desperate defence efforts of Berlin. In light of the challenging circumstances surrounding Berlin's defence, General Helmuth Weidling faced the critical task of organising his staff efficiently. Acknowledging the complexity of the situation, Weidling opted to appoint two capable officers to lead key aspects of his team. Oberst Theodor von Duving, who previously served as the Chief of Staff of the 56th, Panzerkorps assumed responsibility for overseeing all military affairs. Concurrently, Oberst Hans Refior, who had previously held the position of Chief of Staff under Rehmann, was designated as the liaison officer with the civilian authorities. Regrettably, Weidling encountered considerable obstacles to his operational autonomy. The interference from prominent figures such as Joseph Goebbels and other party leaders added an additional layer of complexity, hindering the overall defence effort. The chain of command faced disarray both vertically within the military hierarchy and horizontally across different branches, resulting in inadequate collaboration between Waffen-SS and Wehrmacht commanders. This chaotic state of affairs further compromised the effectiveness of the defensive strategies implemented in the face of the advancing enemy forces. As the Battle of Berlin unfolded, the once orderly streets now lay cluttered with debris, constantly under the barrage of artillery fire that severely impeded the movement of couriers. The relentless bombardment created a chaotic environment, compelling sector commanders to make independent decisions on how to allocate their scarce resources and prioritise defensive lines. General Rehmann's initial defence plan faced formidable challenges in execution, primarily due to a shortage of troops. Consequently, faced with the scarcity of manpower, some commanders made the strategic choice to maintain control over the outer perimeter for as long as possible. 
their objective was to delay the advancing enemy forces and buy crucial time for the overall defence effort. Meanwhile, others focused their efforts on strategically defending fortified structures within the city, recognising the importance of holding key positions. Simultaneously, in response to the evolving and challenging circumstances of the battle, some commanders opted for a tactical retreat, falling back to the S-Bahn line. This retreat served as a secondary defensive position, allowing the German forces to adapt to the relentless pressure from the advancing enemy. The fluidity of the situation required commanders to make quick and pragmatic decisions to maximise the effectiveness of their defence strategy in the face of the overwhelming odds posed by the besieging forces. For the French SS on the first night in Berlin, soldiers encountered an eerie calm that defied the anticipated sounds of combat. Instead of the expected echoes of battle, the air was filled with the sounds of people dancing and laughing, intermittently interrupted by distant rumbles of Soviet artillery. Their journey led them from west to east Berlin, culminating near the Hermann Platz in a brewery where the initial skirmish unfolded. Here, members of the Hitler Youth armed with Panzerfausts engaged in a confrontation with Soviet tanks belonging to advance guards near the Tempelhof aerodrome. Following these initial encounters, the Sturmbataillon, bolstered by Tiger II tanks and the 11th SS Panzer Battalion, Hermann von Salza launched a counter-attack on the morning of April 26th in Neukölln, a southeastern district of Berlin near the Sonnenallee. Unfortunately for the Germans, this counter-offensive fell into an ambush set by Soviet forces, potentially involving a captured German Panther tank, though uncertainties lingered regarding whether it was a friendly fire incident. The regiment suffered substantial losses, with half of its available troops lost on the first day in Neukölln. Despite this setback, the Sturmbataillon valiantly defended Neukölln's town hall in subsequent actions. Facing increased infiltration by Soviet combat groups in Neukölln, General Krukenberg, in charge of Sector C defenders, strategically established fallback positions around Hermannplatz. His headquarters were relocated to the Opera House as the Nordland Division withdrew towards Hermannplatz. During this withdrawal, the French SS and a hundred Hitler Youth members affiliated with their group demonstrated remarkable prowess, destroying 14 Soviet tanks using Panzerfausts. Additionally, a machine gun position near the Harlansee Bridge played a pivotal role, effectively stalling any Soviet advance in that area for an impressive 48 hours. These early engagements painted a vivid picture of the varied and intense encounters that characterised the initial days of the Battle of Berlin. As street fighting erupted in Berlin, the Red Army employed strategic lessons gleaned from past urban conflicts. Drawing from experience, they organised infantry units into small specialised attack groups for optimal effectiveness. A similar approach was taken with artillery and tank units, fragmenting them and assigning specific supporting roles. A typical attack group consisted of a platoon of infantry, one or two tanks, engineers, flamethrowers, an anti-tank gun section, and two or three field guns. While generally effective, challenges arose from the convergence of different armies, such as Chuikov's 8th Guards Army and Katakov's 1st Guards Tank Army, operating in the same southeastern sector, leading to occasional complications. Despite restructuring that assigned tank troops a supporting role and placed Katukov under Chuikov's command, discontent persisted among the tank units. Concurrently, the Red Army's artillery continued to bombard the urban area. Heavy howitzers, sometimes integrated into the attack groups, forcefully cleared their way through barricades and debris, 
In the eastern sector, under Colonel General Nikolai E. Berzerin's 5th Shock Troops, buildings were systematically destroyed by cannons and mortars advancing through the center. Colonel General Vasily Vas Kuznetsov's 3rd Shock Troops adopted a similar approach, methodically reducing buildings to rubble. Relentless barrages from howitzers and Katyusha missile launchers targeted defences, while tanks and lighter artillery addressed closer range and persistent targets. The density of artillery was such that guns were often arranged side by side, wheel against wheel. In the southern sector, Rybalko commanded a staggering 650 guns per mile of the front line, highlighting the overwhelming firepower at the Red Army's disposal in their determination determined push through the German defences. Soviet armies adopted a meticulous strategy during the street-to-street -street combat in Berlin, assigning each infantry regiment a specific street daily. In this approach, two battalions advanced on either side of the road, with soldiers taking great care to minimise exposure. Progress often involved demolishing partition walls between houses and cellars, allowing for strategic movement. To facilitate this, anti-tank guns or explosives were employed to blow away walls and doors, inadvertently leading to extensive fires. The destructive aftermath was vividly described by a German soldier who lived through the harrowing experience. Gradually, we lost our human appearance, our eyes burned and our faces were soaked and smeared with the surrounding dust. The blue sky became invisible everywhere, buildings were ablaze, ruins crumbled and smoke drifted back and forth through the streets. The relentless cycle of destruction and chaos unfolded with each advancing step of the Soviet forces, leaving the cityscape in ruins. The soldiers' recollection continued, noting that the brief silence following each bombardment only foreshadowed the impending tumult. The roar of engines and the clatter of tank tracks signalled the initiation of a new tank assault. This relentless and methodical approach, coupled with the destruction wrought upon the city, illustrated the intensity and brutality of the street-by-street -street combat during the Battle of Berlin. During the intense advance of both Zhukov's 1st Belarusian Front and Konev's 1st Ukrainian Front towards Berlin, a critical lack of awareness regarding each other's positions led to a series of surprises and misunderstandings. Zhukov, initially unaware of Stalin's permission for Konev to move towards Berlin in response to Zhukov's perceived underwhelming performance at Silo, found himself taken aback when Chuikov's 8th Guards Army and Katakov's 1st Guards Tank Army encountered Rubalko's 3rd Guards Tank Army, Konev's armoured spearhead at Schoenefeld Airport on the morning of April 24th, advancing from the southeast. This crucial information reached Zhukov only later that evening, and he hesitated initially to believe it. In response, he ordered Chuikov to dispatch reliable staff officers to verify the units involved, highlighting the lack of coordination and communication at the higher command levels. It became apparent that Zhukov had not been informed of Stalin's authorization for Konev to participate actively in the Battle of Berlin. Following this revelation, instructions from Moscow directed that the demarcation line between the two fronts, starting from the southern suburb of Lichtenraid, would follow the railway to Anhalter Station. This strategic decision meant that Konev's troops still had the opportunity to reach key objectives such as the Tiergarten and the Reichstag. Zhukov, belatedly coming to understand the broader strategic picture, had to adjust to the evolving situation and coordinate with Konev's forces to ensure a more unified and effective approach in the Battle of Berlin. The episode underscored the challenges posed by insufficient communication and coordination among Soviet commanders during this critical phase of the conflict. Upon assuming the role of Kampf Commandant, General Helmuth Weidling took proactive measures to fortify the existing defence system, recognising the limitations at this advanced stage of the conflict. Despite the minimal impact these efforts could have, he sought to address the situation by replacing several incompetent commanders and consolidating defence sectors. 
In the northern front, Hermann's 9th Falskirm Jäger Division held a resilient position around the Flak Tower in Humboldtain. The steadfast defence in this sector allowed German forces to maintain control over substantial portions of the area between the Spree and the northern section of the S-Bahn until the conclusion of hostilities. In Neukölln and east of Kreuzberg, Krukenberg's 11th SS Panzergrenadier Division Nordland held crucial positions. Despite significant depletion, with only 70 men actively engaged in combat, Krukenberg's leadership ensured the division persisted in its defensive efforts. Mumert's Panzer Division Muncherberg fought valiantly at Tempelhof Airfield, still boasting 10 tanks and 30 half-track vehicles. Meanwhile, Rauch's 18th Panzergrenadier Division, relatively robust and equipped with a substantial number of tanks and vehicles, successfully defended the Zehlendorf region in the southwest. However, Scholz's 20th Panzergrenadier Division faced isolation on the Wannsee Island between Zehlendorf and Potsdam, with only 92 soldiers holding their ground. Despite the challenging circumstances, these German divisions under Weidling's command demonstrated varying levels of resilience and determination in their defence of strategic positions within Berlin. The diverse situations across these divisions highlighted the complexity and intensity of the Battle of Berlin during its final stages. As the relentless march of Soviet forces pressed deeper into the heart of Berlin, the shifting defensive strategy led to the gradual contraction of German lines. This tactical adjustment, though resulting in significant casualties, brought about an increased troop density on the front lines, notably featuring a higher proportion of battle-hardened soldiers. A German officer stationed at the Reichskanzlei, reporting on April 25th, acknowledged the prevalent issue of desertion among Volkssturm units, highlighting the grim reality of the situation. In stark contrast, members of the Hitler Youth demonstrated exceptional loyalty and courage, while regular army units exhibited a stoic, calm determination in the face of the advancing Soviet forces. Amidst this desperate defence, the innermost fortifications proved to be formidable obstacles, presenting a daunting challenge for the advancing Soviet troops across various sectors. By April 24th, two Soviet armies had reached the critical S-Bahn line, the third shock troops in the north and northeast, from Wedding to Prenzlauer Berg, and the 5th shock troops in the east and southwest, from Prenzlauer Berg to Treptow. In the northern and eastern sectors, fierce resistance emanated from the imposing flak towers in Humboldtine Park and Friedrichshain Park. Accounts of brutal close quarters combat unfolded around these fortified positions, as German defenders, acutely aware of the strategic importance of these structures, fought tenaciously to repel the Soviet onslaught. The decision to bypass the Humboldtain Tower was not without cost, as the garrison within maintained its operational capability until the battle's bitter end. The Friedrichshain Tower, though a formidable obstacle, eventually succumbed to the relentless Soviet assault, its defenders holding out until the morning of May 1st. Interestingly, resistance varied across different sectors, with some, like the confrontation on Frankfurter Alley in the east, surprisingly proving to be less intense. These brutal encounters on the front lines of Berlin exemplified the ferocity and complexity of the Battle of Berlin, where each street and fortified position became a battleground for survival, leaving an indelible mark on the city's history. At this juncture, the Soviet front had successfully breached the defensive ring enveloping the German capital, primarily focusing their advances in the east and north. The defending forces on the perimeter were a patchwork of remnants from units that had been withdrawn after the intense clashes on the 18th, 20th and 25th. These included Panzer Grenadier Divisions, the Muncherberg Division, 9th Paratroop Division and SS Divisions Nordland and Charlemagne, alongside Volkstorm and various other formations. Despite a garrison totaling nearly 300,000 armed personnel, only around 50,000 were seasoned combat soldiers. The German defensive perimeter faced an unrelenting barrage that resulted in the loss of thousands of defenders and civilians. Paradoxically, rather than weakening the central districts, this onslaught made them even more formidable obstacles. Fanatical SS units, armed with artillery and entrenched tanks, 
fiercely contested every strategic point, often fighting to the last man. The city streets morphed into death traps for Soviet tanks, with thousands of Hitler youth armed with Panzerfausts fiercely resisting their advance. In the vicinity of the Tempelhof aerodrome on the southern side of the city, the fighting reached an exceptional intensity. The Russians grappled with the haunting fear that Hitler, whose location remained a mystery, might attempt an escape using one of the aircraft stored in an underground bunker. The order was given to rush the airfield as quickly as possible. No matter how many Germans were holding or defending, the Soviets would send man after man to secure this airfield as soon as possible. Following a determined assault, by noon on April 26th, the Soviets had secured control of the runways and buildings at the aerodrome, capturing the aerodrome commandant in the process. As the Red Army pushed closer to the heart of Berlin, seemingly indifferent to the cost, desperate German defenders resorted to extreme measures, creating obstacles by systematically destroying everything in the path of the advancing Soviets. With many streets blocked by rubble, the Soviets had to blast their way forward by dynamiting holes in house walls or tunneling beneath the city from one cellar to another. Only then could they progress from street to street, often engaging in brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat. German bunkers, pillboxes and strong points were systematically eliminated, with some defenders surrendering more readily, including elderly Volkssturm and reservists. However, units of SS Nordland and Charlemagne, along with soldiers from various European nations who had joined the SS against the Bolsheviks, tenaciously clung to every mound of rubble. Despite their native being invaded by the Allies and the Reich collapsing around them, these men had no option but to fight to the end, exemplifying the fierce determination that characterized the Battle of Berlin in its most brutal and desperate moments. As the Soviet troops closed in on the Zitadel, General Weidling presented an evacuation plan to Hitler during an evening meeting on April 26. Despite discussions with Goebbels, Hitler rejected the plan, expressing a steadfast desire to remain in his current location and meet his end alongside his troops. Unfazed by Hitler's decision, Weidling and his staff continued refining the evacuation plan, preparing to implement it when the right opportunity presented itself. Under intense attacks from Choikov, the German defenders of Krukenberg's Nordland division retreated across the Landwehr Canal on the night of April 26-27. As the conflict reached the Zitadel, new misunderstandings and communication issues emerged. The Zitadel had its own commander, Oberstleutnant Seifert of the Luftwaffe, overseeing the defence sector. However, the defence of the government district, including the Führerbunker and the Reichskanzlei, fell under the responsibility of SS troops led by SS Brigadefuhrer Wilhelm Monke. Monke considered himself not subordinate to Weidling or Seifert, but directly answerable to Hitler. Krukenberg, who independently offered his division to Monke, also refused to heed Weidling's authority. Living conditions within the Zitadel deteriorated gradually. Due to the perilous streets from ongoing artillery shelling, a significant number of civilians sought refuge in the S-Bahn tunnels. These tunnels also housed numerous injured individuals who couldn't be evacuated from the combat zone. A German lieutenant described the situation in the tunnels under the Anhalter station, stating, The station looks like an army camp. Women and children hide in the niches. Some sit on folding chairs, listening to the sounds of battle. Grenades hit the roof and cement crumbles from the ceiling. Hospital trains slowly roll by. Underground corridors served as various headquarters with Krukenberg's headquarters located in an abandoned rail car at the U-Bahn station Statmit. Despite lacking electric light and telephone connections, the space provided some shelter. Occasionally, artillery shells penetrated the roof, resulting in significant losses. 
On the 27th, water suddenly inundated the tunnels beneath the Anhalter station, leading to drowning and panic-induced trampling among civilians and wounded, whether the flooding was intentional to prevent use by the Red Army, or a result of tunnel damage remains unclear despite its utility to civilians, the wounded and military headquarters. I remember the dim glow of flickering lights cast long shadows across the cold walls of the Berlin S-Bahn where I found myself amidst a gathering of battered and injured soldiers. Many were Dutch, I remember also one next to me speaking Dutch, I think it was. My left leg throbbed with pain, a constant reminder of the shrapnel that had found its mark during the hell up on the surface. Sent down into the underground railway system for medical care, I joined the ranks of wounded comrades seeking refuge from the relentless onslaught above ground. The distant echoes of explosions seemed to resonate through my injured limb as I gingerly made my way to a corner of the tunnel. The air was heavy with the scent of antiseptic, mingling with the acrid smell of smoke that wafted down from the surface. In the subdued light, I could see the faces of my fellow soldiers, each one bearing the visible and invisible scars of war. The S-Bahn, once a bustling hub of transit, had transformed into an impromptu field hospital. Medics hurriedly moved among the wounded, doing their best to provide aid in the cramped conditions. I lowered myself onto a makeshift cot, my left leg throbbing with each heartbeat. Around me, other injured soldiers groaned in pain or winced as medical personnel tended to their wounds. The sounds of distant artillery fire reverberated through the tunnels, a constant reminder that the battle still raged on above. The wounded, myself included. The fear in our eyes was mirrored by the flickering lights overhead, struggling to maintain their luminance amidst the hell of this war. Children, innocent faces stained with dust and tears, were among the displaced seeking refuge. Their presence served as a stark reminder of the toll war exacted on the most vulnerable. Despite my own pain, I couldn't help but feel a sense of responsibility for the protection and comfort of those around me. Many children missing parents, and many parents missing children. It was constant the doors would bash open, and a new soldier would be rushed in with severe wounds, and after seeing so many horrific stains and wounds, my legs started to feel better a little bit. I guess I was lucky I was still breathing okay, and was conscious. In the central districts of Berlin, uncontrolled fires raged, fueled by incessant artillery fire, creating chaos that hindered the efforts of firefighters. The extensive smoke not only made it nearly impossible for German planes to drop supplies, but also thwarted Soviet planes from executing bombing raids. By the 26th, the already sporadic telephone connections between the pocket and the outside world were permanently severed. While military communication systems within Berlin had ceased to function, the regular telephone network surprisingly remained operational. In a desperate bid to maintain awareness of the military situation, Krebs staff resorted to randomly dialing numbers from the phone book, occasionally connecting with unsuspecting Soviet soldiers. A surreal instance was recounted by a Soviet officer who claimed to have engaged in an unreserved conversation with none other than Joseph Goebbels after being connected from Simonstadt in West Berlin. Amidst the escalating chaos, an evening discussion in the Führer bunker on April 29th revealed the dire straits. Weidling, offering a grim assessment, revealed that ammunition was nearly depleted and further drops were deemed impractical. Anticipating the imminent end of fighting within 24 hours, Weidling sought Hitler's guidance on the course of action after ammunition exhaustion. Hitler, rejecting the notion of a total surrender of Berlin, suggested that small groups could break out. Despite the grim circumstances, Weidling still commanded close to 30,000 combat-ready troops, tasked with defending an 8.5-mile stretch from Alexanderplatz in the east to the Havel in the west, with some sectors only a mile wide. 
Throughout the day, Soviet forces had reached the Spree River in the north, overcoming resistance from Berzerin's 5th Shock Troop Army east of the Spree. To the southwest, Berzerin's left flank successfully captured Anhalter Station. From the south, small storm groups from Chuaikov's 8th Guards Army navigated the Landwehr Canal with rafts or crossed the remaining bridges. Despite concealed German artillery and machine guns inflicting heavy losses on the Soviet infantry, Chuaikov had, by day's end, End, seized Potsdamer Platz and reached the iconic Grosser Tiergarten. The relentless advance of the Soviet forces into the heart of Berlin marked a critical turning point, setting the stage for the final desperate moments of the Battle of Berlin. To the west, the pressure on the German lines was notably lighter, with Rauch's 18th Panzergrenadier Division holding the crucial S-Bahn line from Westend to Hohenzollerndamm. Recognising the strategic significance of Heerstrasse and, more critically, the bridges over the Havel at Pickelsdorf connected to this street, Rauch aimed to maintain German control over these bridges for a potential breakout. Two bridges located a few hundred yards further north also remained intact. Defending these vital points in Heerstrasse itself was a Hitler Youth Regiment, initially comprising 5,000 boys, but reduced to a mere 500 due to heavy artillery fire. Seizing on this situation, some redundant adjutants and liaison officers from the Führerbunker successfully escaped on the 29th by travelling down the Havel to the south. On April 26th, Wenck initiated a dawn attempt with the 20th. Army Corps, under General der Cavalleria Karl Erich Köhler, they managed to surprise the less fortified Soviet troops southwest of Potsdam capturing numerous Red Army logistic units and workshops intact. Kohler's forces advanced to a point 15.5 miles from Berlin, establishing some contact with the Potsdam garrison. However, by April 29th, the 20th Army Corps found itself compelled to defend in the area south of Schwilowse. Unfortunately, another planned attack by General Leutnant Rudolf Holste's 41st Panzer Corps, originating from the Rathenau region west of Berlin, failed to materialize. This Western Front presented a mix of strategic manoeuvres and unexpected challenges, as German forces sought to maintain control over key points crucial for any potential breakout. The complex dynamics on this front showcased both the resilience and limitations of German efforts during the waning days of the Battle of Berlin. Shortly before midnight on April 29th, Hitler sought a final update from the OKW regarding the progress of the efforts to assist Wenck and Busu. At one o'clock in the morning, Keitel responded, delivering the grim news that Wenck's advance had been forcefully halted due to intense Soviet assaults south of Schwilose. Simultaneously, Busu's 9th Armee found itself encircled with some elements desperately attempting a breakout to the west and Holsters 41st. Panzerkorps had shifted to a defensive stance around Rathenau. Faced with the realisation that relief efforts had proven futile, Hitler was left with only one desperate recourse, suicide. The looming spectre of a significant Soviet attack on the Reichskanzlei in the early morning hours of May 1st was anticipated by Monke. The combined setbacks on the Western Front and the encirclement of key German forces marked a turning point, signalling the inevitable collapse of the entire regime. As the final hours of the Battle of Berlin unfolded, Hitler's decision to end his life was a symbolic admission of defeat in the face of overwhelming odds. On the morning of April 30th, 1945, Königsplatz, the vast square nestled at the base of the Reichstag, presented a desolate and lunar-like landscape. The once grand square was now marred by numerous craters and a substantial anti-tank trench, its length filled with water, creating an ominous atmosphere for one of the most 
poignant chapters in the Battle of Berlin. In the preceding days, Soviet infantry, backed by numerous tanks, had methodically secured control of several buildings within this symbolic enclosure. Königsplatz, centrally located in Berlin's diplomatic district, had undergone a radical transformation, rendered unrecognizable by the devastation wrought by artillery and bombing. The Red Army, cognizant of the need to minimize losses in tanks and infantry, meticulously planned the takeover of strategic points, including the nearby Moltke Bridge and the Ministry of the Interior. The latter still resounded with gunfire from the last German defenders, even as the surrounding buildings lay in ruins. The operation, while successful, had exacted a toll on the Soviet high command, resulting in considerable casualties. As the shots from the beleaguered Ministry of the Interior persisted, the stage was set for the decisive and final assault on Konigsplatz. The square, witness to the relentless and brutal engagements of the Battle of Berlin, stood as a somber testament to the cost of this protracted and devastating conflict. Huddled within the craters that pockmarked Konigsplatz, German soldiers braced themselves for the imminent Soviet assault. With the first light of day, accompanied by a relentless rain from the overcast sky, nervous hands meticulously inspected the weapons that would soon confront the impending Russian onslaught. The MP-40s, weathered by the passage of time and the harsh conditions of battle, seemed to have lost some of their initial luster. Brave soldiers gazed at the patina adorning the metallic surface of their weapons, as if it were a earned decoration, a testament to their endurance on the front lines, remaining steadfast until the bitter end. As some verified the correct functioning of the trigger mechanisms, others stood ready to load ammunition. Each weapon held 32 cartridges, a crucial lifeline at the impending moment of truth. The more seasoned soldiers drawing from their experience knew that to avoid issues with the weapon, it was more prudent to load 30 rounds, as some comrades, betrayed by the capricious loading system, were no longer present. Approximately 5,000 men positioned in the Reichstag sector listened to the terrifying symphony emanating from the other side of the river Spree. The Moltke Bridge, a vital pathway for Russian armoured units, spanned the wide river and echoed with the ominous roar of approaching Soviet T-34s. The German defenders soon spotted the silhouettes of these tanks on the street leading to Königsplatz. Amidst the smoke and dust shrouding the capital, these steel behemoths advanced cautiously their crews having learned that recklessness on Berlin's unforgiving streets led to swift demise. Suddenly, the air is filled with several streaks of death, German Panzerfaust rockets soaring towards the approaching enemy tanks. In a matter of moments, a barrage of explosions resounds, marking the success of a daring German at the forefront who has skillfully hit the target. The shaped charge projectiles, capable of dismantling the formidable Soviet tanks like mere tin toys, engulf the armoured giants in flames. The initial cheers of the defenders blend with the anguished cries of the wounded as the courageous German tank hunters, in their retreat towards the Reichstag, fall under the relentless fire from the advancing Russian forces. Despite the ferocious resistance mounted by the Germans, an increasing number of Soviet tanks continue to forge ahead toward the Reichstag. Accompanied by infantry groups, these colossal monsters rumble forward, unleashing the thunderous roar of their powerful cannons incessantly. The ground seems to tremble, as if on the verge of breaking apart. The T-34s and formidable KV-1s violently breach Königsplatz, their menacing presence just a step away from claiming victory in this harrowing chapter of the Battle of Berlin. Brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat erupts as the Soviet infantry, fueled by an unprecedented determination to secure victory, clashes with the exhausted German defenders in the square. Emerging from their craters, or taking cover behind the makeshift bulwark, German soldiers extend their weapons aimed at the surging tide of brown-clad adversaries. Hundreds of Russian soldiers unleash a relentless barrage of gunfire, recognizing their numerical superiority over the worn-out defenders. Above their heads, dozens of shells are launched from artillery and tanks, creating a storm of steel and destruction to shield their advancing comrades. The Wehrmacht and Waffen SS infantry engage in a relentless exchange of fire to repel the enemy's assaults. The familiar sound of the MP40 submachine guns resonates, singing their death hymn. Skilled combatants empty one cartridge after another, their fingers pressed against the triggers with 30 cartridges lasting less than 5 seconds. Soon, 
The customary calls for assistance and ammunition echo through the chaos. Wounded soldiers and miraculously unharmed shooters making their urgent requests. The Soviet forces managed to breach into the first lines of trenches, but not without paying a steep toll in human lives, not to mention the losses of formidable tanks. Beneath the facade of the Reichstag, desperate defenders, their fingers firmly on the triggers of MP40s, unleash a hail of gunfire in all directions. In front of them, Red Army soldiers collapse like bowling pins. Behind the walls of the government building, additional Germans intensify their fire from Car 98s, SDG 44s and MG 42s in a seemingly suicidal attempt to maintain their position. The air is thick with the acrid scent of gunpowder and the agonizing cries of the wounded as the struggle for control of the symbolic Reichstag reaches a fever pitch. The basements of the Reichstag emanate the unmistakable stench of death. Crowded with wounded individuals, the dimly lit space offers little visibility for administering first aid to those arriving crushed from the battlefield, and even less for surgical interventions. The innards of the colossal building, mutilated by relentless artillery fire, have transformed into a scene of true carnage. Even the dimness down there cannot conceal the heart-wrenching tableau witnessed by dozens of men, some determined to fight until the end, others teetering on the brink of losing their sanity. As time passes, the battle escalates to unforeseen heights. A desperate request is made to the anti-aircraft tower of the zoo to sweep the entire length of Königsplatz with its powerful cannons, and it is granted. The moment arrives, the deafening whistle of large caliber shells approaching from the western end of the nearby Tiergarten Park. Soil geysers capable of concealing a building erupt from the ground with murderous fury. The Soviet infantry is flung through the air like rag dolls. Even the Russian tanks weighing several tons are propelled into the sky only to crash down again, transformed into glittering scrap metal and human remains. The relentless barrage delivers a brief respite for the beleaguered German defenders, turning Königsplatz into an otherworldly landscape of devastation. As night descended, the forward lines of the Red Army achieved a breakthrough, successfully breaching the defences of the Reichstag. Outside, the scene bore witness to utter devastation. Hundreds of corpses arranged in grotesque postures lay side by side. Their weapons, steadfast companions until the final breath, still emitted smoke from their barrels. These arms had toiled ceaselessly since the early hours of the morning. The lifeless bodies of Russians and Germans, enemies until a moment ago, now embarked on the journey to eternity together. Several PPSH-41 and MP-40 submachine guns, discarded on the muddy ground of Königsplatz, were eagerly picked up by Red Army soldiers who would imminently receive the command to storm the Reichstag. Behind its formidable walls, it was more fitting to face the enemy armed with a submachine gun than with a simple bolt-action Mosin Nagant rifle. The weapons, having exchanged hands, were now poised to play a role in the final chapter of the Battle of Berlin within the historic confines of the Reichstag. In the early hours of the first day of May, the relentless battle persisted without respite. Inside the Reichstag, the conflict unfolded in the narrow corridors, staircases and dimly lit basements. It was an all-encompassing war, fought room by room, where the echoes of gunfire and the anguished cries of the wounded reverberated through the once hallowed halls. Hand-to-hand -hand combat became inevitable in the claustrophobic and dimly lit spaces of the historic government building. Those who defended the Reichstag knew that they were in a dire situation with their backs against the wall and expecting no mercy from the advancing Russian forces. Their only option was to endure until the bitter end. Fanaticism, once rooted in ideologies, had now boiled down to a desperate attempt to preserve one's own life. In the grim and desperate struggle, defenders resorted to shooting at point-blank range against every Soviet soldier who entered, even if it meant doing so alongside wounded or dying comrades. 
The corridors of the Reichstag became a battleground where survival trumped all else, and the struggle for every inch of ground was marked by the intense desperation of those fighting for their lives. In every room of the Reichstag, a fortress emerges, a stronghold defended by men desperate to eke out one more day. The attempt to raise the Soviet flag atop the Reichstag exacts a heavy toll on the Red Army. Each room seized by force resulted in a bloodbath for Stalin's troops. Despite the staggering cost, Soviet commanders persist in throwing more men into the grim building that has become a nightmarish meat grinder. Shattered by shells, the place is illuminated only by candles, lamps and the intermittent flashes and explosions of hand grenades. Electricity, a distant luxury, is nowhere to be found. Throughout the day, amid the Red Army's relentless efforts to vanquish their eternal foe, fierce battles unfold behind the damaged Reichstag walls. Wehrmacht and Waffen SS units stationed there resist and counter-attack, many of which are Latvian, French and other nationalities. The soundtrack of the day is defined by the clatter of submachine guns and exploding grenades. A carpet of spent 9mm shells lines the path of the last guardians of the Third Reich's political symbol. Numerous MP40s continue to punctuate the darkness, joining the deafening symphony alongside STG-44 assault rifles and German Lugers. On the other side, Russian infantry systematically clear rooms almost blindly amid the thick smoke that pervades every corner of the basement. The intense odour of death, explosives and burnt gunpowder saturates the lungs of those still alive, pressing them to persist in the fight. The claustrophobic and dimly lit chambers become a battleground where survival takes precedence and the struggle for every inch of ground is marked by the relentless determination of those fighting for their lives. On the afternoon of May 1st, Labor Day, the Soviet offensive, having rejected Krebs' truce request and with no contact established with the Führerbunker, resumed. Trikov's corps launched an attack after a heavy artillery bombardment on the zoo defences where the Flak Tower was operational, firing at Soviet troops in the southeast and at the Reichstag. Since the tower could withstand direct hits, the Soviets opted for a surrender proposal on April 30th, assuring the safety of German soldiers. Late on May 1st, the Germans accepted the offer, surrendering at midnight. South and west of the zoo, Mumut's Munchenberg division defended the area. On the night of May 1st to 2, scouts discovered weak Soviet troops in Spandau, hinting at a potential breakout. Despite suggestions for a westward escape, Monke decided on a northward break towards the Flak Tower in Humboldthain. On the evening of May 1st, Weidling informed officers and NCOs of Hitler's suicide, relieving them of their personal oath. Negotiations with the Soviets were planned post-midnight, with breakout attempts before. While the Flak Tower surrendered, General Major Otto Sydow of One Flak Division attempted a breakout from the zoo late on May 1st. A group led by soldiers and civilians made a silent escape through U-Bahn tunnels, unnoticed by Soviet forces. Others attempting escape faced clashes and casualties. The Charlottenbrücke witnessed a tragic scene with vehicles and a crowd rushing across amid rain and artillery fire. Following Weidling's radio message to the Soviets about sending another envoy, Theodor von Doffing, along with an interpreter, approached the Soviet lines on the Landwehr Canal at approximately 1 a.m. on May 2nd. An agreement was reached with Trikov, determining Weidling's surrender at 6 a.m. and his troops an hour later. Contrary to the expected time at 5 a.m. using Moscow time, Weidling was picked up and taken to Trukov's headquarters. 
Accompanying Weidling were retired generals Kurt Voitash and Walter Schmid Dankward, who had volunteered in April 1945 to aid in the defense organization. At Chuikov's headquarters, Weidling drafted his surrender order for the Berlin garrison, emphasizing Hitler's abandonment of his soldiers through suicide and urging an immediate end to all opposition. The message was recorded for broadcast via propaganda vehicles near the remaining pockets of resistance, although the directive stipulated that that all hostilities cease at 1 p.m. The last German troops didn't surrender until 5 p.m. Many soldiers, unable to escape to the West, became prisoners of war after Berlin's fall to the Red Army. Contributing to this was Wienax 12. Army moving away from Berlin, preventing the majority of German troops from joining Wenk or reaching the Elbe with the hope of surrendering to the British or Americans. General Major Sidow's unit, numbering several thousand, surrendered west of Berlin on May 3rd. Krukenberg, who initially hid in North Berlin, eventually surrendered to the Soviets. Monka's group, reaching the Flak Tower in Humboldthain, decided to surrender around 8 p.m. upon learning of Weidling's capitulation in a nearby brewery. In the final days of Berlin, the Red Army, despite its numerical and technological superiority, suffered significant losses due to hasty and careless attacks. Some units, led by Marshal Konev, witnessed the loss of every officer. Infantry units of the 2nd Guards Tank Army reported staggering casualties of up to 95%. Street fighting took a heavy toll on tank brigades, leading to substantial losses. The Battle of Berlin resulted in around 80,000 Soviet casualties, with 275,000 soldiers injured. The Soviets claimed losses of 2,056 tanks, self-propelled guns, 1,220 cannons and mortars, and 527 aircraft. However, actual losses may have been higher. The Soviets reported around 70,000 prisoners of war in Berlin, including a significant number of civilians, including women, sent to labor camps in the Soviet Union. The uniform type did not matter. Even firefighters and railway officials were included. Estimating German casualties is challenging, but surveys conducted shortly after the war suggest over 22,000 civilian deaths in central Berlin and a similar number of killed soldiers. Including suburbs, the German casualty figure is estimated at around 106,000. Helmuth Weidling, who commanded Berlin's defense for nine days, faced a military tribunal in Moscow in 1952 and was sentenced to 25 years for alleged war crimes. He died in a prison in Vladimir, east of Moscow, on November 17, 1955. Werner Mummert, former Münchenberg division commander, died on January 28, 1950 in Shuya, northeast of Moscow. Generals like Gustav Krukenberg, Wilhelm Mohne, Josef Rauch and Otto Sido were sentenced to 25 years but returned to Germany in October 1955. Less prominent officers like Wojtasz and Schmid Dankward volunteered for Weidling's staff and were released in 1949. Weidling's chiefs of staff Hans Refio and Theodor von Dufing eventually returned to Germany. Most prisoners of war in lower ranks were released by the late 1940s and those labelled as war criminals by the Soviets saw Germany again in 1956. Prisoners of war held by the Americans or British generally had more tolerable conditions and shorter durations. Senior officers, not extradited to the Soviets and without war crimes convictions, were usually released after two or three years. Theodor Busser, Gotthard Heinrichi, Hasso von Mantufel, Felix Steiner and Walter Wenk all returned from captivity in 1947 or 1948. The toll exacted on the civilian population during this time of conflict is profound, extending far beyond the grim statistics of death to encompass a landscape of enduring suffering. Nowhere was this more evident than in the aftermath of World War II, where the German civilian population bore witness to unprecedented levels of trauma. The magnitude of this devastation is reflected in the staggering number of reported sexual assault cases in and around Berlin, with estimates suggesting that nearly 2 million German women fell victim to such heinous acts. One harrowing snapshot of the consequences unfolded in the heart of Berlin in August 1945, where the plight of the civilian populace reached a tragic scenario. Out of 2,204 children born, a chilling 1,104 did not survive their infancy. 
The spectre of infant mortality loomed large with rates soaring to nearly 100%. These distressing figures as documented by US correspondent Dorothy Thompson. When nations crumble and the protective fabric of society disintegrates, women are left exposed and vulnerable. The surge in sexual assault cases witnessed in Germany serves as a brutal reminder of the dire consequences that befall societies torn apart by conflict. It shows us the urgency of learning from such historical lessons to safeguard the well-being of future generations. French SS volunteer provided a chilling account of the brutal street fighting in Berlin in his diary and memoir. He detailed the haunting experiences of the wartime urban battleground, recounting how, amid the lulls in the intense combat, the piercing shrieks of women echoed throughout the desolate streets, creating an atmosphere that he described as nothing short of hellish. Fenet's first-hand narrative offers a sobering glimpse into the profound human suffering that unfolded during those tumultuous moments. And that brings us to the end of our gripping two-part series on the Battle of Berlin. If you've enjoyed this journey through history, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more exciting content. Doing so helps us a lot. I hope you found our exploration of the Battle of Berlin insightful and engaging. It's crucial to understand the events that shaped our world today. If you learned something new or have any thoughts to share, drop a comment down below. We would love to hear from you. Also, remember to check out our Patreon for more content. And the support on there helps a lot. We thank you. And also check us out on Instagram for extra content will be linked below. As always, we thank you so much for the continued support and growth recently has been amazing and we will see you in the next video goodbye for now